uh, presentations we speak about a specific topic in shoulder pathology. Uh, we will start with uh, our eminent speaker, Professor Mohi Taha from uh, Switzerland. Professor Mohi, Dr. Mohi Taha will speak about the innovation and mixed reality in shoulder arthroplasty. Professor Mohi. This is Mohi Taha, I'm a fellowship trained uh, shoulder and elbow surgeon from Switzerland. Mixed reality is the merging of real and virtual worlds to produce new environments and visualization. In the following two cases, I will be showing how we can use this modern technology for pre-operative planning of joint replacement and how to use it intraoperatively. Today, I'm presenting a case of an 83-year-old female suffering for pain and the limitation of range of movement for the past six years. Constant score is 21. Subjective shoulder value 30. Here in the CT, you see the cranial migration and erosion of the glenoid. On the axial views, uh, you can see the retroversion and uh, bone defect uh, posteriorly, which we measured to be 13 millimeter. The 3D planning shows the defect uh, cranially and uh, posteriorly as well as inferiorly. Dr. Gabato from Brazil helped out uh, creating the augmented uh, reality reconstruction of the CT so that we can uh, take a deeper look into the case. Moreover, uh, he was kind enough uh, to plan the bone graft uh, for us. Dr. Thieringer helped us by printing the scapula 3D so we can take it with us into the operating theater. Now you see there is a big bony defect, so I thought to solve this problem I could use navigations. So I went and visited Dr. Drum in Germany who introduced me to the system how to plan the 3D planning using the Exatec software and he showed me two of the cases uh, he done at that day. The installation is uh, simple uh, by uh, fixing a bar to the operating table and then covering the GPS with stride uh, drapes. After that I decided to try this uh, system in our case and the Exitec uh, team came over uh, to give a workshop to our uh, crew. How do I know it's at the end or it's when it's tight? That's okay. I think it's going to be tight.
Also ich habe keine Ahnung, ob zum Bau fällt. Ja, ja. 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 This is the intraoperative x-ray and here you see the postoperative x-ray. Thanks for watching. I would like to present a case of a 48-year-old female patient with history of two failed calf surgeries. Now pain and limited range of movement. Subscapularis is gone. If you look at the cartilage from the arthroscopy, it's also gone. So we decided to convert her to a reverse. Here we could use Mixed Reality to view the current situation with a pyrocarbon hemiarthroplasty. From every side, you can turn it around. Here we view the preoperative planning, also using HoloLens and the Mesh app to turn it around. Here you see some artifacts uh, which are produced during the segmentation due to the hemiarthroplasty within the CT. Here we're using another app to view a 3D hologram, subtracting the glenoid and concentrating on the K wire. You can also turn it in every direction. Now getting ready for the operation, wearing the HoloLens, this is a deltobectral approach, going through the previous scar, then performing the external release uh, or subdeltoidal release. Now we go through the scar of the subscapularis, we couldn't really find a tendon. But uh, here you see the biocarbon hemiartoplasty, so you see the head of it. After peeling the scar, you have a good view on the head. Now release of the upper border of the pick measure. Then getting the fork. So you can use it to remove the head, tapping with a mallet, and uh, we get the head relatively easily. After that, we expose the glenoid. We'll be able to have a good view. After that, we perform uh, the internal release and removal of uh, soft tissue, including the rest of the labrum. As soon as we have the glenoid ready, now we open the Cyclops app and uh, view our planning. Here you can uh, turn it in every direction and uh, put it beside the patient so you can the direction. You can also change the color of your uh, hologram and choose a suitable color. While it's inserting the key wire, you can uh, still view the hologram simultaneously. The hologram could be adjusted uh, to the anatomy of the patient. We were able to uh, maintain the stem and convert it to reverse. This is the uh, intraoperative and uh, postoperative results. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mohita from Switzerland for this very illustrative presentation.
Thank you so much, sir. We will uh, delay uh, the discussion till the end of the session. Now the second speaker will be uh, Professor Mohammed Imam from uh, East uh, London East University from uh, UK. Professor Imam will speak about acromioclavicular joint injuries. Professor Imam. In the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about acromioclavicular joint injuries. I am Mohammed Imam based in uh, Saudi uh, UK. In the next talk, I'm going to talk about acromioclavicular joint injuries, which are very common sports injuries with both acute and chronic presentations. The high rate correlates with, um, with uh, more than 100 reported surgical techniques described for management over the years. The anatomy and configuration of the ECJ makes it a resilient joint that can resist a significant amount of force before disruption. Yet, it is one of the few major joints in the body where dislocations can be managed without intervention. In the next few minutes, we'll review the anatomy, biomechanics, as well as assessment, diagnosis, and different treatment protocols, including our preferred protocols for various ACJ injuries. We know that the CC ligament is the strongest ligament controlling the acromioclavicular joint. We all know that it's formed of conoid and trapezoid with tensile strength of over 800 newtons. The anatomic landmarks and isometric point of the CC ligament on the undersurface of the clavicle has been well described. When we wrote uh, this book a chapter in uh, the very important textbook, we found that there has been debates all over the years on uh, the best way of managing a chromoclavicular joint. However, there wasn't a lot of debate on the dynamic and static stabilizers as well as the biomechanics. For many years, we knew that the acromioclavicular ligament and capsule plays a majority of horizontal stability, whereas the CC ligaments provide a large percentage of supra inferior or vertical stability. And we know for many years that the deltotrabezial fascia plays a crucial role for horizontal and vertical stability. That's why Fukuda affirmed that if maximum strength of healing after an injury to the acromioclavicular joint is the goal, all ligaments should be allowed to participate in the healing process. But we sometimes, we did, that wasn't followed in all the described surgical techniques. We have to understand that the acromioclavicular joint is a subcutaneous joint without a large sleeve of muscle protection. It's more prone to injury mainly because the sternoclavicular joint is very stable. Direct and indirect trauma can cause this type of injuries. However, Tosia and Rockwood have highlighted the sequelae and the cascade of disrupted joints. Starts with, starting with the acromioclavicular ligament, then the coracoclavicular ligament, then the coracohumeral ligament, deltotrabezial fascia, finally, loss of the suspensory support of the shoulder girdle and the shoulder will fall downwards. They popularize their classification, which is widely used. However, evidence did not really support the inter and intra observer reliability of this classification. Diagnosing these acute obvious injuries is not rocket science, but we have to, because these patients will have sudden pain, cradling arm, obvious deformity, and x-rays might be obvious, but not all the time. In subacute or lower grades, it might be hard to define these injuries. However, you'll find these patients having pain on lying on their side, struggling with overhead activity, lifting, pulling, pushing, and... Sometimes it might be even so subtle to the extent that only a dynamic ultrasound scan, as per, as per, which was popularized by Petrons in 2007, is the only modality that can differentiate this type of injuries. You might not need an ultrasound scan to manage this, but there are a few tips we have to understand. We have to understand that these patients will have limited abduction in most of the time, especially in higher grades. 
X-rays can be enough most of the time. There is actually no need for MRI scans. And the three tips. Am, am I going to manage this with surgery? Possibly, yes. Are you going to manage this with surgery? That's a debatable question. Okay, so let's understand things a bit more. First, as with every other thing in orthopedics, we do not treat x-rays, we treat patients. So treating according to the grade here might not be the best option because we know from previous publications like this paper by my good friend, Mr. NG, has proved that the reliability of the classification system is not as high as we would like it to be. And so when you see a patient with this type of injury, you have to clinically assess and possibly your impression and your decision would be completely different here. Second bit you have to understand, and this is an important tip, it's, this is a scapular injury, not a clavicular injury. And that what was highlighted in 2009, that 70% of these patients will have scapular dyskinesis, especially with chronic type 3 acromioclavicular dislocation. And that's why you have to understand the difference between locked and shocked scapula because complete SAJ disruption, especially grade three to five, are clinically obvious with the classical deformity. They might be locked or not reducible as the clavicle overrides the acromion. A locked dislocation may not allow a full clav scapula excursion, which will lead to a variable limitation of elevation. If type three, then these are likely to become type three P dislocation. However, some complete dislocations may be unstable but can be easily reprodu reducible. We call this a shock dislocation or type 3A on the Essex classification. Both type 5 and type 3 dislocation behave in this way. We therefore prefer to describe these injuries by mechanically as shocked or locked as this has a more functional predictability and effect on the management than the degree of vertical translation alone. And we, the third tip is it's not all about CC ligaments. We know, as from the previous slides, the acromioclavicular joint and ligaments and the deltotrapezial fascia plays an integral and crucial role in the stability of these joints. And that's why the 100 techniques at, at addressing one, or, uh, one of all these variables have failed over the years. And that was proved by Harris, who demonstrated that none of these reconstruction techniques were able to restore the normal biomechanics of the acromioclavicular joint. So that's why I would prefer undertaking what I call the triple anatomic technique, bearing in mind that it's a scapular injury and you're managing patients clinically and not radiologically. In our book chapter, we published this uh, algorithm, simple algorithm, see patients at one week, if they are coping, three weeks, if they are coping, so review them again in three months. We call it the coping versus non-coping approach. So for this patient who's obviously not coping, what I'll do, I'll use a Nottingham approach and then uh, address the CC ligament first. My preferred reconstruction technique would be the large ligament with very strong uh, um, tensile strengths that enables me to reconstruct the conoid and the trapezoid in anatomical tunnel compared uh, with the actual tunnels. And then I'll use the modification by the right inter modification of having figure of eight. And here actually in the right inter modification, it just tying uh, the large ligament ends. Here I actually stitch the ends together. 
Yes. And then aim to reconstruct the acromioclavicular joint ligaments. This is the original CA ligament transfer in which it was transferred from the coracoid to the distal end of the clavicle. But the modification we currently do is actually taking the CA ligament from the coracoid and using it to construct the end into the uh, end of the clavicle so that it, it has a very strong proprioception rule. Another way of addressing the reconstructing the acromioclavicular joint would be using the large ligament as well in this fashion in order to reconstruct the ligament. And finally, in all cases, we do deltotrapezial fascia reefing, which we know from 1963 it is crucial for abnormal biomechanics of the joint. And finally, you can see the two screws used to for the ligament. This is the pony anchor used for the CA ligament transfer. Same, same protocol for all of these patients. You have to be extra cautious when you see these clavicular fractures. You can see that this, this was an open fracture where the clavicle end penetrated the trapezium. The fracture was fixed large ligament used to reconstruct the CFC ligament. CA ligament was transferred and fixed with uh, intraosseous intra uh, repair and deltotrapezial fascia reefing undertaken. Patient open fracture healed. Six weeks after surgery, patient has regained good range of motion. What about failed fixation? Actually, that's a big topic for next meeting. Thank you very much. It's really crucial to see the whole picture. It's really crucial to address the to whole see the problem. Whole picture. Thank you. It's really crucial to address the whole problem. So much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Mohammed Imam, uh, London East University, UK for this excellent presentation. Now we will move to the third speaker, our eminent speaker, Professor uh, Presmeslo uh, Lobratowski from Poznan University, uh, Poland. Uh, Professor uh, Lobratowski will speak about the cuff repair with collagen membrane. Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to, for me to be a participant uh, of this great session. Thank you for your invitation and congratulations for organization. And I'll be speaking about the arthroscopic rotator cuff repair augmented with collagen membrane. Um, we know uh, very well that cuff tendons do not heal easily and the returns may happen quite commonly up to 40% in most of the reports. Some returns or not heal tendons, they will do worse clinically, clinically and biomechanically. And we also know that chronic tears may lead to irreparable status, and that is often associated with decreased function and strength. One of the ways to help the healing of the process of the calf tendon is to use the augmentation of the tendon. It has a mechanical and biological meaning for the repaired tendon. It may be used as a bridging to bridge the gap between the tendon and the bone or as an overlying or overlapping membrane over the repair area. It is mostly indicated when we see the likelihood of the poor healing after primary repair, mostly when the poor quality of the tendon is faced and the generation as well, or when we are facing the repair. However, we need to have a nice muscle belly to work with, so no significant atrophy has to be uh, present in the, ten, in, the, in the muscle. We've seen from the number of studies uh, and also those recent studies that would collect the data from meta-analysis and systematic review over 1,000 of the cases that if we use the augmentation, we may anticipate decreased rate of the returns, 25% versus 41% uh, when there is no augmentation applied. It works well both for the allograft membranes or synthetic membranes. 
there is also clinical improvements over uh, the over the time with the patients when augmentation has been used. However, the difference is not very significant. This is one of those cases when you would have traumatic and degenerative tendon tear with clear delamination and degeneration of the tendon. Then you may anticipate that in that case the healing may be compromised and one of the ways to improve it is to use the membrane that you would use uh, together with the repair area using a lot of sutures that usually come from the double row repair technique but also some extra sutures to be using as a leash to put pull the tendon inside and this is how it can be done it is technically demanding procedure and it usually takes a little bit of time and you need to have a proper experience with the with such an advanced technique it's feasible it's possible to be done you can see that the graft is pulled inside the uh, tendon over the tendon and there are some extra sutures that will be used uh, from the from the anchors that have been placed in the middle row and this is final picture after repair of the tendon then you can see that the membrane is nicely covering repair sites however recently there have been a new technique implemented uh, using the bioinductive collagen membrane that comes from the bovine uh, tendons that has been pure, pure that collagen has collagen has been purified processed and actually prepared and manufactured to deliver the mesh uh, that actually is not very mechanically strong but it's meant to have a nice and effective uh, biological support for the healing it's not only the membrane it's a whole system that uh, in includes the liver device staples pla staples that you use to fix the membrane to the tendon and peak non-resolvable staples that you would use to fix the membrane to the bone and it is meant to cover the footprint area so it need to overlap with the bone not purely on the tendon only and now we'll show you the case 66 years old male uh, with the traumatic uh, supraspinatus tear but also some signs of degeneration as you can see on the mri with the osteophyte formation and thinning of the tendon this patient had a lot of pain had been limited in active range of movements had the weakness with positive job but no external rotation weakness and we have done you can see that there's a thin degenerate uh, supraspinatus tendon that has been repaired or double row repair but some part of the footprint has been still left uncovered that's why we decided to use the the membrane you can see that there was a delivery device uh, delivering the membrane inside the subarachnoid space the device allows to deploy and compress a little bit uh, membrane against the tendon another cannula is used thin cannula through which you can put the staples you can see that the PLA staples are nicely fixing the membrane to the tendon usually use six or a little bit more around the margins of the membrane and also inside and once this is done we would like to fix the membrane to the uh, osseous area to cover the repair site so you can you need to use a special gun that pierces the bone and through that you can deliver peak staples to fix the membrane nicely at the mar lateral margin of it usually use two or three of peak staples and at the end you end up with membrane nicely covering repair area that procedure it's much shorter than the previous one usually takes 15 to 20 minutes to finish the insertion of the membrane and the final picture is that a uh, patient has improved and has much better function and more so the tendon is fully healed uh, to the uh, footprint area and no visible graft in four months time there has been some evidence uh, limited yet uh, with the recent studies perspectives mostly uh, applying the membrane to heal partial medium or large or massive cafters with significant clinical improvement over time with rare or no complications however no implant related and MRIs would show retail rates all more or less 11 percent in three months a little bit more 17 percent in one year with graft visible at three months time only in six percent of the cases and not visible in one or two years observation one of the studies showed newly formed tissue and partial tears 
However, there have been so far no comparative studies. So the conclusions are that with the new implants, it is technically more feasible and easier to use it as an arthroscopic device with some early promising results with calf augmentation. However, there are no clear best indications yet. Uh, probably that could be applied for the general component of the tire when we would like to augment the footprint area and uh, maybe also for power shelters as well. However, we need more studies to prove uh, the efficiency of the methods. You may use your phone now to actually scan the code and this QR code will lead you to our YouTube channel when you can see 360 panoramic educational video. And also this technique has been prepared for you to watch and learn. So you can see every bit of the step of this procedure using either goggles or you can just use your mobile devices to see that. And finally, I would like to invite you uh, for a Congress in September. Hopefully the current situation lets you be a part of our meeting. Um, so feel invited to come to Poland in September. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Lubiatowski from Poland, from Poznan, Poland, for your excellent presentation, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Now we will move to the next speaker, Professor Magid Sami, Professor Magid Sami from Einstein's University. Uh, Professor Magid will speak about uh, traumatic sternoclavicular dislocation. Mr. Khaled. We all face cases with anterior dislocation of the sternoclavicular joint. Rarely are they indicated for surgery, unless there is persistent pain, risk of skin sloughing with severe indentation of the skin, or there is severe cosmetic disfigurement. The stabilizers of the sternoclavicular joint include the anterior and the posterior sternoclavicular ligaments, the important costoclavicular ligament connecting to the first rib and the interclavicular ligament. This case is a 34 years old male. He came presenting two months after a motor vehicle accident because he had multiple fracture ribs and an epsilateral fracture scapula. He waited for all this to heal. He presented with severe cosmetic disfigurement, persistent pain, and there is a risk of skin sloughing. As we can see on the chest x-ray, no, no real information can be gained apart from the previously known scapular fracture. For the CT, we can see the dislocation on the right side and you can realize that this medial end of the clavicle is not as smooth as the left side. And these are the previous fractures. Again, you can realize that this end is not as smooth as the left side. And this tells us that this is not a simple dislocation. This is a fracture through the most medial end of the clavicle. And these are the cases which usually show severe displacement and skin indentation. So this is how it looks. And if we try to reduce it and push it posteriorly, you cannot fully reduce it. We made straight incision exposing the sternoclavicular joint and of course no skin incision should be passing directly over a skin prominence, over a bony prominence I mean. We exposed the shaft of the clavicle, again trying to reduce it after doing the incision, you cannot reduce it, it's still anterior to the sternum. We had to remove about one centimeter from the most medial end of the clavicle and then we can see that this is a small part. It's about 1.5 centimeters in this part and less than one centimeter on this part. It's too small to allow a secure fixation. So we decided to excise it and go for a reconstruction of the sternoclavicular joint. So we excise the medial end of the clavicle. Be careful that the brachiocephalic trunk is quite near to the posterior aspect of the joint and therefore you should never violate the posterior capsule of the sternoclavicular joint. So 
Now, this is the medial end of the clavicle having excised the small part. This is the articular disc having removed the medial small part here, and we will excise also the articular disc. This is the removed medial part, and after removing the bony prominences, the bony parts on the medial side, you can see that you have an easy reduction. We harvested the semitendinosus tendon, removed this part of the clavicle, and this is the reconstruction we want to do. So what we want to do is do two tunnels from anterior to posterior in the clavicle, and two tunnels from anterior to posterior on the sternum, but the posterior exit should remain anterior to the posterior capsule of the sternoclavicular joint on the sternal part. And then we will start passing our graft. Always the tunnel should be like this, anterior to the posterior capsule. The graft will pass like this. From this is a long graft, so we have enough lengths that we can use for additional fixation. But now we will take it from posterior to anterior on the most proximal sternal tunnel, and then anteriorly, and then from the distal going from anterior to posterior, and then going for the proximal clavicular tunnel, going from posterior to anterior, anterior to the clavicle, and then from posterior, and we have a figure of eight. And then we have additional tunnel, with additional anterior support. It's a long graft and this is a modification of the technique. For doing the tunnels on the clavicle, we support posterior with a Hohmann retractor to protect. And for the sternum, we do the sternal tunnels, make sure that they go anterior to the posterior capsule. And then we pass the graft from posterior to anterior on the more proximal sternal tunnel and we pull it and this after we pull it so this is how it looks and then we pass the graft anteriorly and then again from anterior to posterior so it's coming from posterior to anterior passing anterior to the sternum and going from the distal sternal tunnel from anterior to posterior And then we do the same for the clavicle to have the figure of eight. So from posterior to anterior, going anteriorly, and then from anterior to posterior. And we can do additional fixation with fiber wire sutures directly from the sternal to the clavicular tunnels. We have an additional tunnel that we made in the clavicle because we have more length in the graft, so we can pull it from superior to, in, to inferior in the clavicle, and then we use it for an additional anterior support, as we can see here, like this. And this is how, finally, it looks, very secure fixation. And there is no skin tenting, as we can see. This is the part of the skin that was about to slough. So this is how it looked, this is how it looked, and this is how it finally looks. Nothing is pushing on the skin. For the immediate post-operative, we have to do an x-ray to make sure that there is no pneumothorax. The take-home message is, skin tinting is more obvious with medial endoclavical fractures than with simple dislocations. In medial end clavicle fractures, always assess medial small fragment size. If it's too small for secure fixation, then go for excision and reconstruction of the sternoclavicular joint. Take care not to violate the posterior capsule of the sternoclavicular joint. This is very critical because the brachiocephalic trunk is quite near. It's strongly advised to have a thoracic surgeon attending. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Maggit Sami, for this very important presentation. Uh, now we will move to the next speaker. The next speaker will be uh, Professor uh, Mauricio Raffaelli from uh, Brazil. Welcome, Dr. Rafael. Hello, Mohamed. Hello, my friends. Hello, Hello my dear uh, friend. Can I share my screen? Yes, please.
Dr. Rafael, you will speak about shoulder arthropathy. The presentation is okay, yes. Mohamed? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to talk about the shoulder arthropathy in young patients. I really think that's a, a kind of thing that we need to start to, to talk about a little bit more because uh, with the pass of time, some younger patients start to have some problems in the shoulder. So we need to talk about that in an anatomic one and reverse arthropathy. Uh, this is the group that I made part. I have the, the happiness to stay here with two friends of my group, Dr. Zé Carlos Garcia is our chief leader, and Dr. Marcelo Boulos de Mello, Dumas Mello, is a great friend of mine from my, our group, and is a huge pleasure for me representing the Brazilian in the, the Brazilian Society of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in this event. I don't have any disclaimer for my presentation, and I just want to share a case for a young patient with some trouble, in the, in sh some shoulder trouble, to talk about the atropathy. My patient was a female with 36 years old. She, was, she is an engineer, and she reported some pain and limitation in the right shoulder for approximately 20 years, but with severe pain in the last three years. Important pain in daily activities, worsen pain with minimal efforts, and she denies another pathology and some medications. This patient has a huge history from uh, she was born at 36, 35 weeks in Curitiba, is a big city in the south area from Brazil. And she presented hours after uh, the boy was born, fetal erythroblastosis or RH incompatibility. Performed with 24 hours blood transfusion, and she had a hospital infection diagnosed at 30 days of age, developed pyotritis of the right hip and the right knee, drained arthritis in the right knee, in the right hip at the 30 days of life. And it was talking for her family, for her parents, that the child had another infection, but she was too, too young to make another surgery, another big surgery. And this kind of infection was treated with antibiotics. At one year of age, she uh, diagnosed it with a problem in her right hip and a little bit minor problem in her left hip, a great shortening of her right lower limb. At seven years old, she presented six centimeters of shortening of her, her right lower limb. And at 10 years old, she had 10 centimeters shortening in her right shoulder, right lower limb. Where she came to Sao Paulo in a big hospital, Pavilion Fernandinho Simons for Santa Casa, and was diagnosed, uh, diagnosed uh, uh, right hip dislocated and performed the osteotomy of the pelvis and stayed at hospital for four months. Mm -hmm. After the pelvic osteotomy and reduction of her right hip, 4.5 centimeters of shortening remains. At age of 15 years, she performed in Curitiba again, I stretching with Elizarov in her right femur for nine months. At this time, she started to use crunches. And with the use of this crunch, she noted some problems in her upper limb, uh, uh, principally in this right one. She maintained an important clinic of pain in her right hip. And in 2003, at the age of 23 years old, she underwent for a total atropolacy of her right hip, a ceramic, ceramic atropolacy. So, uh, discrete right lower limb claudication, uh, the physical examination of the right knee have some limitation. She, has, uh, uh, she had a painful and limited range of motion on the right shoulder with 85 degrees of flexion, minus five degrees of standard rotation, and a great trochanter internal rotation, and a painless but limited left shoulder with 115 uh, degrees of flexion, 15 degrees of external rotation, and lumbar vertebral two in internal rotation. Uh, some limited in the right elbow, in the left elbow two, and a painless right and left hip. 
Uh, I try to evaluate the cuff and instability of the right shoulder of this patient, but she had, she had a lot of pain and limited range of motion. It was very difficult to understand if she had some strain from this uh, rotator cuff or some instability of her shoulder. No neurovascular alteration in the upper and lower limbs. So I bring here some pictures for this patient. Here after the uh, uh, pelvic osteotomy, here with 15 years old with Elizarov to improve the size of the femur. Here the x-ray from his, her, her right knee and actual x-ray for her right hip with a ceramic ceramic arthroplasty and a, a plate to improve the strength of the femur. But here's the importance. Look for her elbows. She had some deformity in her elbows, but no pain in elbows. So she needs to uh, become better from her right shoulder. And this is with D here, D is the right part and E is the left one. So this is an external rotation X-ray. Look for, she didn't have the humor head. She didn't develop the humor head because she had some infection over there. And the glenoid is too thin. And uh, you have a part of the humor head in her left uh, shoulder and she has a glenoid. So looks like that she had an articulation here in the left, uh, left shoulder. So uh, she had some move movements and no pain. And here is, uh, is trying to do an axillary view. Look for this right to one. There is no articulation over there. The MRI of this patient is very difficult to understand because you don't have uh, the humor head. You have a lot of fibrosis inside the articulation. Looks like that uh, the humor head or the humerus, upper part of the humerus, was dislocated for the front part of the glenoid. The glenoid is too thin, but you still have some external rotation uh, tendon here. And when you look for this cut of the MRI, look for some atrophy for the supraspinatus. The infraspinatus is very atrophic and you can't see the subscapular uh, muscle too. Okay, what about the treatment of this patient? Uh, we discussed with the patient, explained the complexity of the treatment, complications and possible, possibility of developments, and opted for total right shoulder atropacy. At this time, I really don't know what I will perform to this patient, if an anatomic one or a reversal one. Perform the surgery with the anatomical and the reverse atropacy in the OR. What we I found in the, in the surgery, I observed intraoperatively with the humerus head previously dislocated anteriorly, got huge fibrosis inside the articulation, a very fragile anatropic curve, uh, principally the supraspinatus, the subscapularis tendon, a, a dysplastic glenoid, a proximal humerus with a huge deformity, a curved deformity, a, 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 a medial deformity, and so I opted for reverse arthropathy. And did what I did is very difficult to find a, a place to put this hole. This patient uh, didn't have a head to improve the, the size of the glenoid to lateralize a little bit the base plate. Uh, she, she, knew that, uh, she knows that we, we, we can uh, get better uh, movement range of motion but not a fantastic one because the deformity is, is huge, is big. Here you can see the, the deformity of this humor. So I only can put this seven, this number seven uh, nail from the, the humor part, but I think I can fix uh, with two screws in the upper in the north and the south screws. And I had a very good fixation of this atrophy. This with six months of, of a post-op, I bring here a, a, a very good uh, tomographic and show, for, and show it for me that I found a very good place to put my center pin and two screws of the fixation. And the glenoid was very good. And this is the patient. Look for now he, uh, she has a better move for the right uh, shoulder when you compare to the left shoulder. And this is a video for the patient. Show, showing, she is showing for us that the movement is very good and this patient is very satisfied with this uh, result. And she knows that the reverse shoulder atropacy is uh, uh, very difficult. She needs to preserve uh, her right shoulder to have a better life and a good range of motion.
So I bring here some papers to discussion about a young patients, but these papers now just talking about 65 or 16 years and younger patient, not a, a very younger patient like this patient. Uh, in this paper, the reversal total shoulder atropacy from massive ripple of cup here showed for us very good result in 10 years of uh, follow-up. This another one is a, a, a reversal total shoulder atropacy in a 60 years of age or, or younger. Another paper showed for us that 81% uh, 80, of our patients had good results, but when you compare to the older one, uh, we have 96% of older patients with good results when you compare with young one. And this is another paper, uh, a little bit younger patients with 16 years and younger. And this is a very good paper that showed for us that uh, we have 2.8 years of follow-up in this young patient with reversed total shoulder atropacy. Uh, this result was good, but we need to study a little bit more time to observe that this patient maintained over time this result. I just want to say thank you again uh, for uh, being invited to participate for the great meeting. This is our group again, Instituto Nayon from Brazil, and thanks a lot. And I am here for some discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, my dear friend, Rafaeli. Excellent as usual. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker will be also from uh, Brazil, from my own institute, my dear friend, Professor Jules Carlos Garcia. You are very welcome, sir. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Rafael. Good evening, Marcelo. Nice good evening, Mohamed. It's very nice to see you again. We hope this craziness of COVID goes out and you can meet uh, personally. But for now, we need to, to, to begin to uh, make this webinar. I will share my screen. Is it okay? Let me share it. Can you see my screen? Uh, Hello? Not yet, sir. It's, it's black, all black. It's black, yeah. Can you see? <laughs> yeah, I um, can see it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from my own institute, Sao Paulo, Brazil, like my friends, these are my disclosures. Uh, I'll talk about scapular dyskinesia. Uh, we have a lot of movement to scapula, elevation, downward rotation, protraction, upward rotation, depression, and retraction. All these movements are very important and have uh, use different muscles. We have to understand that the, the rotational center of the scapula moves lateral during the upward rotation. Then it has an instantaneous rotational center of the scapula. It's not uh, a fixed point in the scapula. There are some diff uh, different uh, patterns of scapula, a winging scapula. You have the inferior ang angle, type one, that's very common in patients with problems of anterior serratus anterior muscle. Medial border, that uh, is more uh, common in uh, trapezium and rhomboids, superior border that's common in rotator cuff pairs and uh, cuff arthropathy. Uh, when the scapula uh, has some impairment based on its uh, nerves, we can do some transfers or endoscopic release depending on the case and depending on the, le uh, the level of neurologic impairment. Um, when it's very important, like these ones, it's more uh, like to make some uh, transfers. I will show there are so uh, this difference. We talk about the type one and type two that we will focus now. This is a patient I have that's type one. You can see that scapula this retracts medially and downwards rotates because it does not have the serratus anterior muscle. The long thoracic nerve is uh, damaged in this patient. But you have another uh, uh, other types. This is type two that I'll focus on this uh, talk. When I have this patient, it's a 30 years old doctor, right? Important impairment of all the trapezium. 
does it have impairment of the homboid or levator scapula, as you can see here. I like to abduct 90 degrees and ask the patient to uh, posterior rotate the shoulder in order to, to see if you have impairment of these muscles too. If these muscles are okay, you can make a uh, new surgery. Here, the patient has the rhomboid minor, the levator scapula is here, and the rhomboid, rhomboid major is here. In this video, you can see that in the right side, it's impossible to uh, retraction of the scapula. The retraction movement is very impaired. The patient can't do that. And how do we treat it? Well, uh, we have like, here the electromyographic studies showing this impairment, MRI. But how do we treat? Classically, we could treat by Eden surgery, Eden lunge that uh, transfers the rhomboids and levator scapula. Bassan changed the surgery to a triple uh, tendon transfer. That's very interesting because gives the inferior tilt of the scapula again with rhomboid major. However, this both does not uh, have the full um, axis of the strength of lower trapezium. Then we have moved to this procedure, uh, when, whereas have the medialization of the latissimus doors with less moment for downward rotation caused by the latissimus doors. During abduction, changes from downward rotation movement and depression to upward rotation because as the rotational center comes from medial to lateral, we, it can work to elevate in the um, uh, the, 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 the the angles the, the superior angles of the scapular movement. Here, uh, sorry, you can see how it works. How I think the latissimus is more alike to work as the inferior uh, trapezium than the uh, rhomboid, and I keep the rhomboid. Here's the angles of the trapezium, the, the latissimus dorsi, sorry. Here is our publication, and I'd like to show you how we do that surgery. The surgery we do by a robotic approach of the latissimus dorsi. As there are no uh, lateral cavities in this place, we create a, a subcutaneous cavity. Then I insert endoscopically uh, the robot on this patient. And here, oh sorry, is how I manage this, the surgery, how I, we do the surgery, just out of the, 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 the surgical field in the robot. Here is the robot, how it works when I'm doing this. And here, the patient with a subcutaneous dissection, final subcutaneous dissection. Here we can see the rhomboid major over here. Here is the latissimus dorsi. So you can see its fibers. We use air, we don't use uh, physiologic uh, saline uh, infusion. Then we cut the latissimus dorsi, separating the latissimus dorsi from the bone bring the latissimus dorsi here, separating it from uh, its adhesions of the uh, teres major. Here's the latissimus. Then uh, here is the quadrangular space. You can see, you don't go this way because it's, it, it's not so good. And here we can suture the latissimus dorsi tendon to in order to pull it out of the body and make stronger sutures to uh, fix this uh, tendon. Here I'm pulling out of the body. And here I have the latissimus dorsi. I have just small incisions. 
Here I have the levator scapula and rhomboid minor that I will transfer to. Here's the latissimus. Then in the same place, I insert the latissimus inferior, I insert the levator scapula superior and more medial, the rhomboid minor. Here is the final uh, suture and the final appearance of the surgery. Very cosmetic and uh, minimally inv invasive surgery. These are the results of the patient, seven weeks post-operative and 11 weeks post-operative. You can see that uh, even uh, against strength, the patient uh, can work very well with the scapula. And here is very impressive how, uh, how retraction returned. This is before and 11 weeks post-surgery. I'd like to thank you very much in the name of our institute with my friends Marcelo and uh, Raffaele and see more details of the past events and keep it updated to 22 uh, course. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Garcia, for this very interesting topic. Thank you so much, sir. Now we will move to the uh, next speaker, also from Brazil, uh, Dr. Marcelo Poles uh, from Nayun uh, Institute. Dr. Marcelo? Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. Yes, can I share my screen? Yes, please. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, for the invitation, Professor Mohamed El Ashab. It is an honor for me to be here with uh, people from my group and, and the Egyptian so uh, society. Uh, I will talk about uh, an easier case so people can uh, brief again. So this is a, a, a female, 55 years old, uh, one year of rotator curve repair uh, of he, uh, her right shoulder. So uh, she, she had pain and weakness for six months and she was doing uh, a physio, physiotherapy treatment during all this period. Also, this is uh, her uh, physical examination uh, in the OR. Uh, she has no strength in, the, in this arm. She can maintain, but no strength at all. So she came to me with this MRI uh, showing us a very uh, big lesion in the posterior, uh, superior and posterior cuff. So the question is what, what to do in this case? Uh, today we have uh, so many options and doing only a rotator cuff repair, a revision in this case uh, is not uh, a, a perfect solution because we have to add something more for this patient to, uh, she, she can have uh, again her, her strength and, and relieve the, the pain. So uh, we have to decide about the shoulder arthroplasty a tendon transfer or a superior capsule reconstruction or a membrane that is showed here for us today. So in this case, uh, I decided to do a, a, a lower trap transfer. We learned uh, from uh, Basim, our a great friend in our course, course in to, uh, 2018 in Brazil. So he showed us uh, how to do this in live surgery. Oh, he, and it was very great. So <laughs> he, 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 the, the, the mm. Mm. So he showed us uh, the, the, the forces uh, that are in the, the shoulder and the Trapezius is a good solution because the, the direction of the force is almost the same of the 
uh, infraspinatus. So uh, in this case, I use uh, uh, some tendinous uh, graft. You can use uh, 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 homologous grafts too. Uh, can be uh, the, the, from the knee and from the leg. Uh, in this case, you, you use uh, from the patients. So this is the position that we do. This is uh, the, the lower trap, how you recognize this, and we, we harvest, harvest this and put out from this wound. So then we transfer the, the graft uh, into the joint. So we, we pull the, oh, the, the, the wires that we put in the, the graph. This is the voice of uh, another friend of us, the Dr. Alvaro Mota, that he's always with me in the surgeries. So we put uh, the, the graft inside the joint first. We tied this in the, in the humerus, and then we do the suture in the, in the trap. <laughs> so this is the the graft uh, he's tied in the, the humerus. In this case, we can do a partial repair, uh, but the the quality of the tendon is not good. That's why it's better for the patient to, to address something more. So this is the patient in four months, uh, four months uh, from the surgery. It's a good movement. Actually, his movement, it, it, her movement, movement is not that bad. So, but she she had pain and no strain. So in this case, uh, the relief of pain and and, and the improvement of the strain is the, is the, the thing. And that's it. That's it. Thank you very much for the invitation. This is my case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marcelo. Thank you so much for being with us tonight and for accepting my invitation. Uh, by the way, I uh, invited uh, Bassem Al Hassan from uh, USA, but unfortunately, he's traveling overseas in the same time. I hope we will see him again in another session. Now we will move to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker will be Professor Bashar al Ulabi from McMaster University, Canada. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me today. It's an honor for me to be here uh, talking to you. I'd like to commend the organizers for such an incredible job that they've done here with this meeting with the uh, esteemed uh, faculty and panelists in such a wonderful gathering and uh, opportunity. So thank you very much for having me. I'd like to talk to you today about a case uh, that recently uh, with a shoulder hemi reverse arthroplasty, also known as a reverse shoulder hemi arthroplasty. Um, essentially, this is a case of a 35-year-old uh, male who's an active student, paralegal, healthy, non-smoker, right-hand dominant. As a teenager, he had a proximal humerus fracture that was treated non-operatively, and he doesn't really recall many uh, details about it. He has been having pain in the right shoulder for the last uh, number of years. It affects his daily activity uh, as well as his work and leisure activities. He has uh, seven to eight out of 10 pain uh, with any shoulder uh, motion or activity, uh, discomfort at rest and decreased range of motion. Um, his physical examination demonstrates a decreased range of motion, 70 degrees of uh, forward elevation, 70 of abduction, 25 external rotation and internal rotation to the sacrum. And this is significantly decreased compared to the contralateral side. His rotator cuff strength is normal. He has a negative belly press test, uh, painful arc of motion, and crepitus and pain with any resisted activity. He's really exhausted on operative treatments, uh, physiotherapy, activity modification, cortisone and hyaluronic acid injections has really not helped him as much. And he's at the point where he really wants a surgical treatment. Uh, his infectious uh, workup is completely normal. So you can see here, is, uh, here are his x-rays and uh, you can uh, appreciate that there is some form of a malunion or of a deformity of the proximal humerus, likely at the anatomical humeral neck. 
Um, and you can see bone on bone arthritic changes. Um, and specifically on the axillary view, you can see some posterior bony erosion and what seems to be a B2 type glenoid or biconcavity in his glenoid. However, when you get a closer look with the CT, you can see uh, in the left view, left image here, closer to the top of the glenoid, uh, there is a, a kind of a biconcave uh, glenoid. But as we get closer to the lower part of the glenoid, you can actually see uh, what see what looks more like a dysplastic glenoid or a significantly retroverted glenoid uh, with a decreased bone stock of the, of the glenoid. And really, this glenoid does not fit uh, the Welsh classification in any way and uh, seems to be a hybrid of, of different uh, of different glenoid types, so likely because of the post-traumatic uh, nature of it. We did get an MRI, which didn't add much except to show a big uh, uh, tearing in the posterior labrum. And again, features that are not fully uh, uh, compatible with a dysplastic glenoid, although there may be some component of that. When you look at a 3D template, you can see towards uh, the glenoid retroversion is about 17 degrees, but as you get closer to the lower part of the glenoid, it actually is more closer to uh, 22 or more degrees. The interesting thing is that he didn't really have a lot of posterior subluxation of the humerus, which is usually what you would see in a B2 type uh, glenoid. So what are the options? You know, I discussed this with a number of world leaders and got their thoughts. Essentially, the options are to do an anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty with a bone bone graft on the glenoid side. And unfortunately, in the literature, um, these have not had a great success or the revision rate is quite uh, high uh, due to failed bone grafting or failed uh, or loosening of the glenoid. Um, yeah, so, you know, we, we didn't think this was going to be the best option. Uh, an augmented glenoid with an anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty was an option. However, given his age of 35, we already know from the literature that the, the, the bigger the, the glenoid augments are, the earlier they are to, to, to fail or the, the earlier they are likely to fail. And so at 35, even if it buys him 10 years, you know, then he's likely going to have a huge uh, deficiency in the in the bone stock of the glenoid um, and uh, need a huge revision. Um, and, you know, we didn't really think at 35 this was the best option for him. Um, reverse shoulder arthroplasty would have definitely been an option. But again, at 35, I was concerned about his young age. I have done it in thir in patients in their 30s for, revi for revision cases. Um, but in a primary situation in a 35-year-old, I was really hesitant, although the data does seem to show that um, the reverses are lasting quite long and maybe this is the way to go. And finally, for those who have suggested that this may be a dysplastic glenoid, an inset glenoid was an option as well. If you look at a templating, this is a, an anatomic glenoid, and you can see the, you know, a, a big void in the back there with not a lot of contact uh, with the regular anatomic uh, implant. And if you wanted to ream the anterior side to try to get better bony contact, then you'd really be uh, getting rid of most of the bone stock on the glenoid. So not a good option. Uh, when we look at templating an anatomic uh, augmented uh, glenoid, you can see this actually, you know, with a medium or a large augment, it does restore his version. However, the issue is that the uh, peg here in the middle is already taking up essentially all of the glenoid vault. And so the concern again is a few years down the road uh, when this uh, fails, um, that he's likely going to have a huge bone defect and we're going to be in a much more difficult situation at that point. So again, maybe not necessarily the best option for him. Yeah, fortunately, I happened to be visiting Joel Walsh during this time uh, in France, and he suggested that he had done something called a hemi-reverse arthroplasty, where um, he would put in a glenosphere, base plate in a glenosphere over a bone graft on the glenoid side without putting in any humeral component. So again, the reverse of the regular hemi-arthroplasty. Um, so instead of doing the humeral side and nothing on the glenoid, we're, doing, we're putting in a bone graft, a, 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 a base plate, and a glenosphere, but nothing on the humeral side. And generally, this has been done in revision cases where there's concerns about the stability or the fixation on the glenoid side. And so to avoid the forces, uh, a humeral implant is not put in as a, as a first stage. And then as a secondary stage, uh, you know, the surgeon would go back and put a humeral component. But he, had suggested, he, had, but he mentioned that a few of his patients ended up uh, being quite happy with it and did not require a second stage. And so he, he thought uh, maybe this was, would be a good option for this patient to build more bone stock on the glenoid side. So in fact, this is really what I templated. Um, even though Joe Walsh said that this is actually, uh, he, he had only done it in, in a revision cases, but never in a primary case. But, you know, I did actually end up 
templating this for a big bone graft to try to restore the bone stock on the glenoid side, and then uh, plan for a hemi reverse uh, using the largest glenosphere and try to lateralize this as much as possible uh, to try to make the cuff uh, work a little better. And you can see this is one of the few cases in my career where I've, I have used the PSI guide, um, mainly because I wanted to make sure that every uh, step of this was uh, perfect. And so we did uh, use a PSI guide for the central pin, and then we put in a bone graft and put in a base plate and then the largest uh, glenosphere with some lateralization uh, with it. And on the humeral side, you, we used an astabular reamer to create a concavity that would match the size of the glenosphere to couple them together. So here's the post-operative uh, x-rays. Uh, you can see a bone graft behind the glenosphere here and lateralization as much as we can with the glenosphere and uh, bone. Um, but obviously there's only so much we could do uh, with without putting in a humeral component. And also with the post-traumatic nature of this, um, it's usually uh, a lot of scarring and it was difficult to lateralize anymore. Um, the patient comes back at three months quite happy. He was already starting his rehabilitation. Um, the subscapularis and the lesser tuberosity osteotomy had actually healed well, and um, he had very minimal pain at this point. Um, at six months, we got an, a, a CT scan, which demonstrates a uh, good initial incorporation of the bone graft with the glenoid. Uh, so we're quite happy with this. And I just saw him uh, a couple months ago for the one and a half year follow-up, and his pain level is only about two to three out of 10. Uh, he occasionally has some pain above shoulder uh, activity, but he's quite happy with his uh, with his outcome so far. Um, his motion is still pr is pretty good, not excellent or perfect by any means, but uh, very functional range of motion definitely much better than what he had before surgery and uh, very minimal pain when he does this. So um, he was quite happy with uh, with the outcome. Obviously, my concern uh, is that over time, you can see that the humeral side is eroding more and he's starting to, to get thinner uh, around the greater tuberosity. And so, you know, I think we do need to monitor this over time to make sure that he doesn't uh, erode more bone or goes on to a, a greater tuberosity fracture. And obviously, he still may end up needing to be converted to reverse shoulder arthroplasty at some point soon. Um, and so I'm not sure whether this was worth uh, or whether we should just done a reverse from the beginning, but uh, time will tell. Um, this is just another example that uh, one of my colleagues showed me a few days ago of a 47-year-old history of alcoholism, uh, missed posterior dislocation two years ago with significant bone erosions on the humeral side and the glenoid side from the posterior dislocation and significant pain. Uh, um, an anatomic arthroplasty or a hemiarthroplasty is really not an option here given the amount of bone loss. A reverse is really concerning in an alcoholic uh, due to their risk of uh, recurrent dislocations. And so this is another example where I suggested that this hemi reverse with a bone graft on the glenoid may be a good option for the patient. And then by a few years until the patient's uh, better controlled from the alcohol perspective, and then can be converted to a full reverse at that point. Um, when you look at the literature, there's really not been a lot described for this. Uh, uh, Brad Edwards uh, has the only publication demonstrating three cases, which were all revision cases, due to uh, inadequate fixation on the uh, uh, on the glenoid side with the base plate and glenosphere. And so, as a concern, they did uh, they did they did not put a humeral component uh, and stage this, and then realized that I think one or two of these patients did not want a, a second stage and were quite happy with their outcome, and the rest went on to receive a humeral component after the glenoid side had incorporated well. Uh, Jill Walsh has described this in a number of uh, cases that he's done in the in conferences, but never uh, published yet. Um, but again, to, same thing in revision cases, and he's done a good number of them. And I think George Athwell and uh, Jill Walsh all are uh, compiling their cases now for a publication on this uh, technique. Uh, these are the other two cases that uh, Brad, Edley, uh, uh, Brad Edwards uh, uh, shows in his uh, publication. So in conclusion, shoulder hemi reverse arthroplasty is a good option for revision cases with questionable fixation on the glenoid side due to excessive bone loss, usually as a stage procedure. Um, but it may be an option for primary cases with bone loss in young patients that are not suitable for a full reverse shoulder arthroplasty. My recommendation in doing this is to make sure you repair the cuff if you're going to ever do this. Uh, lateralize as much as you can, both with bone and with the implants, and use lar largest glenosphere. 
Um, uh, one in retrospect, I would not recommend you use an acetabular reamer. I think the less reaming on the on the humeral side, the better. So probably just a small spoon uh, of bone, just to create a very small concavity and let the humeral side uh, find its way, would probably be better to decrease the uh, the acceleration uh, of the bone loss on the humeral side and give it more time before it erodes. Uh, thank you very much. for this very, very important and very interesting presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Now we will move to the uh, final uh, presentation done by uh, Professor Amr Andil, Monofe University, Egypt. Professor Amr. Rahman Rahim. First of all, I would like to thank the Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology of Panha University and the Egyptian Orthopedic Association for this kind invitation to participate in such wonderful meeting. This talk is about interarticular arthroscopic soft lethargy technique for primary and revision management of glenohumeral humor instability. Recently, this technique has been accepted for publication in Journal of Arthroscopy Techniques. According to literature, lethargy procedure remains the gold standard management option for linear humoral instability with significant anterior glenoid bone loss and for revision of failed arthroscopic linear humoral soft tissue reconstructive procedures. However, lethargy procedure has been linked to a number of complications such as coracoid graft fracture, nonlinear and resorption, in addition to glenohumeral humoral arthropathy, which in turn can be partly explained by coracoid graft malpositioning. In order to overcome these complications, Lavos et al. introduced arthroscopic lethargy procedure, which actually perpetuated previous complications by higher incidence of neurovascular injury, slower learning curve, more graft and screw malpositioning, in addition to scapular dyskinesia. Based on these complications, especially bone block related arthritis, different arthroscopic non pony techniques have been investigated as alternative to lethargy procedure by gaining advantage of soft tissue structures as conjoint tendon, subscapularis tendon, or long head of biceps tendon. As regards to long head of biceps tendon, different techniques of rerouting and tenodesis of long head of biceps tendon to the anterior glenoid have been published, introducing the concept of dynamic anterior shoulder stabilization for management of soft tissue lesion of glenohumeral instability in patients with insignificant glenoid bone loss. Meanwhile, in a cadaveric model, Candir reported that rerouting and tendesis of long head of biceps tendon to the critically deficient anteroferial glenoid are technically feasible, safe, and can effectively restrain glenohumeral humoral translation. Actually, these previous techniques are somewhat technically demanding, time-consuming, and costly. So, in our current practice, much more simplified technique is exercise for cases of type 5 slab lesion and deficient capsulabra complex in non-critically deficient glenoid. In this technique, arthroscopic pancreas repair is followed by soft tissue tendesis of long head of biceps tendon to upper portal of subscapularis using two simple stages of non-absorbable sutures. As in this case of male patient of 27 years old with right-sided recurrence of clean humoral instability. His pre-operative MRI revealed the type 5 slab lesion. Meanwhile, examination under anesthesia revealed anteroferial glenohumeral humoral instability. However, diagnostic arthroscopic glenohumeral humoral examination revealed non-engaging hill sac lesion. So the patient was managed by arthroscopic pancreas repair by three suture anchors followed by soft tissue tendesis of long head of biceps tendon to upper port of subscapularis using two simple stitches of non-absorbable sutures. Ten-week post-operative evaluation revealed almost restoration of normal range of motion of the operated shoulder. In addition to negative anterior drawer speed and operant tests compared to the sound contralateral shoulder. Another case is male patient of 42 years old with recurrence of glenohumeral instability of his right shoulder. 
His pre-operative imaging evaluation revealed type 5 slab lesion in addition to insignificant anterior glenoid bone loss. Examination under anesthesia revealed anterior inferior glen humor instability. In addition, diagnostic arthroscopic glen humor evaluation revealed type 5 slab lesion. So he was managed by arthroscopic pancreatic repair followed by soft tissue diseases of long head of the biceps tendon to upper part of subscapularis by two simple stitches of non-absorbable sutures. Twelve-week post-operative evaluation revealed restoration of normal range of motion and stability of the operated shoulder. These favorable and promising outcomes of current reported technique represented the drive to use the same technique in more complex cases as in the case of revision management of glenial humor instability, as in this case of male patient of 21 years old with right-sided recurrence of glenial humor instability following arthroscopic pancreatic repair. His preoperative imaging evaluation revealed the presence of type 5 slab lesion, insignificant anterior inferior glenoid bone loss, large hair sac lesion, in addition to the anchors of his previous arthroscopic pancreatic repair. Examination under anesthesia revealed the presence of anterior inferior glen humor instability in addition to a positive load shift test. Diagnostic arthroscopic examination revealed the signs of failed arthroscopic pancreatic repair and the engaging health sac lesion. So the patient was managed by rain brassage, revision of arthroscopic pancreatic repair and interarticular soft arthroscopic lethargy technique. Initially, an anchor was inserted into the heel sac defect, and sutures were passed without suture tying <coughs> through the posterior capsule and the infraspinous tendon. Then, stiff and displaced anterior capsular complex was released, reduced back to its footprint, and repaired by three suture anchors. Afterwards, through anterior lateral portal, a suture loop was passed through the long head of the bicep using a suture passer. Then this suture loop was retrieved by a suture passer through subscapularis and then out of the anterior mid glenoid cannula. A ring forceps is then used to retrieve the free ends of this suture from the anterior lateral cannula to the anterior mid glenoid cannula, where sutures are tied in order to hold the tendons of long head of the biceps and subscapularis together, following soft tissue tinnitus of the long head of the biceps to upper part of subscapularis by two simple stitches, tonotomy of long head of the biceps is performed, brain is completed, and the whole repair reconstruct is checked by trooping. Twelve-week post-operative evaluation revealed the restoration of normal range of motion and the stability of the operated shoulder, in addition to a negative anterior drawer test and the speed test when compared to the sound contralateral shoulder. From a biomechanical perspective, current report technique is to offer three out of four of clean humoral restabilization mechanisms of lethargy procedure, including sling effect, increased tension within subscap fibers, and physical concurrent capsular repair. However, Current report technique doesn't reconstruct the bony glenoid. Nevertheless, normal glenoid articular concavity could be partially restored by the current technique by concurrent capsular repair. In addition, the bony glenoid reconstruction offered by lethargy procedure is effective mainly in early range of motion, which is not the provocative position for green humor dislocation in most of cases. This might be supported by academic study of stabilizing mechanism of lethargy procedure by Momoto et al., which revealed that the bony factor of lethargy procedure is responsible for about 45% of green humor <coughs> stability, mainly in early range of motion. Current report technique is to offer the following potential advantage including its feasibility to be employed in different glenoid humoral stability conditions such as type 5 slab lesion, poor soft tissue quality of the anterior inferior capsular complex, and in repair management of glenoid humoral instability. In addition, there are no complications related to coracoid graft harvest, transfer, or fixation. 
no significant limitation of range of motion, especially of external rotation is expected. It is technically safe. It is an arthroscopic technique. In contrast to other techniques, Pankert repair is performed before pricep still these two subscapularis, while the green humor joint is still capacious and hasn't been occupied by the bicep tendon. Most shoulder surgeons are familiar with this TLDs technique. No hardware is used, and when it fails, revision surgery would be relatively easier. However, current report technique is non-anatomic. In addition, ovoid deformity is a possibility due to failure of TLDs. In conclusion, for management of glenohumeral instability, preliminary outcomes of current report technique are favorable. However, this technique should be investigated in long-term cohort clinical studies in order to clarify its long-term validity. Much thanks. This to our eminent speakers. If anyone has questions from our dear panelists, Can I ask a question to uh, Dr. Taha? Yes, please. Yes, please. I uh, have you been using this uh, navigation and hollow? I'm sorry. Have you been using the hollow holograms together with the na navigation? Yes, we have also. Um, you can use both. You can combine them, but they are different systems. So navigation and holograms is using the Hololens, which is from Microsoft. So this is independent of which processes or uh, joint replacement system you use. You can use it with any system. Navigation is specific. So navigation system comes from Exatec and you can only use it with the Exatec implants. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, may I ask uh, Dr. Mohi Taha, uh, what the, the actual time needed to do uh, the navigation? to use the navigation system in one of uh, those complex cases in uh, reverse shoulder? If you use it with a normal uh, case without uh, bio RSA and augmentation, this case was like a difficult one with a lot of bony loss. We had to, to uh, do everything freehand with the uh, humeral head, but, and that's what takes time. The navigation itself adds about 15 minutes to your procedure, thus the acquisition of the glenoid and coracoid and adding that um, fixation to the coracoid process. So plus time is 15 minutes for the navigation itself. The other time is actually operating itself and adjusting the bone graft. Mm. So in the uh, concurrent setting, do you think that the navigation give you an advantage over the uh, conventional uh, 3D planning or 2D planning. Um, I mean, there are a couple of advantages. Um, mm -hmm. If you use like patient specific instrumentation or PSI, you need to print this. You need to wait for four to six weeks to get the gadget. You need to sterilize them. So you skip this step when you do navigation. Uh, second thing is you see getting the PSI with the patient-specific instrumentation is a guide, but you don't really know if you place it in the correct position. You can still put it upward two to five degrees is what we see in the literature, where you can still be out of your planning. And with the navigation, you see real time, where is your pin, where is each screw you are placing and how long it is, how deep it should be. So um, it gives you a live real time um, examination feedback. of the glenoid and the feedback, so you see it one to one. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions from our dear panelists? Um, I would uh, like to, Professor uh, Amr, yes, please, sir. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Imam uh, about the acromioclavicular um, uh, injuries. Um, uh, do you think that uh, the transfer of the coracoacromial ligament uh -huh. to the uh, lateral end of the clavicle would it, um, provide uh, a sufficient strength uh, for uh, the horizontal translation 
of the acromioclavicular uh, joint, or um, uh, as it had been described by Imhoff and in other publications, the figure of eight uh, reinforcement for um, the acromioclavicular joint through the tunnels in the lateral end of the clavicle and in the medial end of the acromion. Thank you, Dr. Amr, for uh, this interesting question. Uh, and uh, actually, so what we tend to do, I do the large ligament around the coracoid in figure of eight, and that has been proved to be associated with high tensile strength. And in the same setting, we move the cora as a CA ligament from the distal uh, from the coracoid and put it there, and that has an acrom uh, proprioception effect. And uh, and also it augments the strength uh, to some extent, and also the delta trabecul uh, the delta trabecular fascia reefing. Uh, so we do the three of them at the same time. And actually, we're we're publishing uh, what minimum one year follow up of twenty five patients. Now it's not published yet, and we demonstrated that this this uh, we have excellent results so far. So we don't know the actual answer because different techniques, as I've mentioned, has been proposed. But I think, you know, the, the consensus, uh, the main message would be to li trying to address all injuries at the same time, all ligaments at the same time. But I know I'm aware that, you know, the figure of eight is really important, but uh, I also can help managing the problem. But it's, it, the, main, the main consensus now is actually to address all three structures at the same time. So either use artificial ligament or CA transfer, but I think the CA transfer might have uh, an uh, the advantage of adding the reception effect in uh, the reconstruction. Um, aren't you afraid of uh, the occurrence of an atherogenic injury of the lateral end of the clavicle with too much drilling and screw fixation? Yes, so in our results, we have one fraction uh, trying to put the anchor in actually at the lateral end in a, small Asian lady, but uh, we did nothing to manage that fracture. It was just at the anchor, it was a metallic anchor. And uh, she had an Oxford shoulder score of uh, 42 at six weeks, uh, eight weeks from surgery. So actually it is a risk obviously, but uh, it, it is a small, we use a small, I use a 3.5 uh, anchor in fixing the acromial ligament. Uh, in there. And what I really think is important is the delta trabecial fascia, putting it back uh, uh, on the top of the clavicle, which also has a very good advantage. But I'll send you the results uh, when we finalize the writing of it. Thank you for your nice presentation. No, thank you. Dr. Mohammed. Hello. Yes, please. Okay. okay can I ask a question for yes, Dr. Mohammed? Yes, transfer. Hello? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Right, sir. For Dr. Marcello, about uh, some technical points regarding our trapezius syndrome transfer, I would like to ask about the reproduction of the anatomic footprint. Where uh, does he uh, put uh, his tendon or do tenogesis on the humeral side? And I want uh, to ask about the position of the shoulder while uh, suturing the tendon graft to the uh, trapezius. Yes, uh, I, I usually put the arm in 45 degrees of external rotation and 60 degrees of elevation. Okay, and I fix first first the graft into the, the humerus. I usually put this in the uh, posterior superior part of the tubercle. So, uh, and then uh, we, we fix the, the graft uh, into the trapezius. Okay. Yes, I would like to press. What? Press. Do you use the post over for abduction press? Sorry, I, I didn't abduction hear. Abduction below or abduction press, press. post operative, Dr. Marcelo. Elevation and external tension. Immobilization, immobilization. 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 I, I sling with the with the abduction, yes. Or I sling. Dr. Mohamed, can I ask you a question? Of course, of course. Of course uh, my question is for Dr. Amir about the, uh, the long head of biceps to use like a stabilization for anterior part of the shoulder. Our group here in Brazil, we have a, a, a surgery. We describe a technique too. 
but we open all the groove at the long head of the biceps, pass the biceps through the subscapularis and fix it with a screw, with a bicep screw, a small bicep screw. I just want to talk about the technique of Dr. Amer. Uh, doctor, you don't fix in the glenoid, the long head of the biceps. You only fix in the upper part of the subscapularis, yes? You try yeah. to create the sling effect, not some fixation, okay? That's no. why I understand. Uh, I, I adopted, to some extent, I adopted a technique uh, published by Beju in 2016. I think he is a Brazilian orthopedic surgeon uh, using uh, soft tissue tendinitis uh, for, uh, as a management of biceps lesion. Here we adopted this technique in green humor and instability in more difficult cases like more soft tissue quality, type 5 cell lesion and revision management. Here, uh, following uh, to pair, we uh, do uh, tenodesis or soft tissue tenodesis of the long head of the biceps to upper border of subscapularis uh, by two simple stitches. Then we do tenotomy. This uh, what we can call interarticular soft arthroscopic lethargy. Uh, again, we have the new technique, and I think it has been recently accepted in arthroscopy techniques in which we uh, make tenodesis from outside the joint. And I think it uh, may offer more reproducibility of the sling mechanism of uh, lethargy. Uh, technically, in our current practice, the primary outcomes are favorable. And uh, the main concern is mainly about the bovine deformity in such young active population. But we haven't met this complication yet. But it can offer a very good uh, option in order to um, increase the uh, green humoral restabilization, especially Thank in revision so management. Thank you Thanks so much. Thank sir. you. Thank you so much. At the end of this magnificent session, I would like to thank all our eminent guest speakers and our panelists for finishing and uh, uh, upgrading our uh, knowledge about the shoulder in this very important session. Uh, thank you so much. Hoping to see you again and again in all scientific activities. Thank you so much.